I'm thrilled to be sitting here with Noah Hawley in his office. Noah, I'm excited for a number of reasons. God, that's can, good to hear. Can I enumerate them? Because you look excited. Yes, I want a list. Uh, reason number one, you're in Los Angeles, which is a very rare thing these days. Yes. It's nice to see you here. They no longer have an extradition treaty with Brazil, so <laughs> that's I right. can come here now. Two, uh, Legion was renewed for season two today, so congratulations. God help us all, it was, yes. Three, we're, we're talking on a Wednesday, my favorite episode of the season, uh, Chapter 6, airs tonight, so we're going to get to talk about that. Yes. Um, but mostly I'm excited because the last time we sat down for a podcast, um, the next day you hired me for a job. Yes. So I really want to know, first and foremost, what are you going to give me after this podcast? Well, my car is very dirty, so oh, I was yeah. hoping maybe if I gave you a few bucks. I could yeah. wash that. Yeah. That's not too dissimilar to what the job is in general, right? Exactly, yes. It's uh, it's uh, my favorite story. There was that great New Yorker article about Brian Grazier where they talked about how he woke his assistant up at 4 a.m. to come to his house because there was a cricket in his house. <laughs> so uh, I try to uh, rise to that level of, of, of boss manship. And now that assistant is the head of Universal. Probably. Right? So yeah. it works. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll, we, we can TBD what, what's coming my way, but... Your car did look a little shabby. Okay. Um, I feel like we should we can start with some one of chapter six specifics because sure. people that'll be fresh in people's minds. Um, it was uh, that was my favorite storyline during my experience in the room. Um, Good. It was it was I think it was chapter four when I was there, and then it became chapter six, and and mutated around a bit. But to me, it was the most thrilling just when it was first being kicked around because it was so rich with possibility. It was deeply disturbing and unsettling, um, even when we were just trying to crack it. But it was also rich with opportunity to do such great character work, because you finally get to see all of these people who we've seen in their um, best selves, in their yeah. super heroic state, see that a lot of what makes them quote unquote special could also make them uh, mentally unwell. Yeah, that that idea that, you know, these people have been defined by society a certain way to say that, you know, this, that this quality that you have is is a negative, you know, you hear voices or you see things or you can't be touched and, and that's a mental illness. And then, um, and then, you know, they're taken somewhere and, and told, no, 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 that that's your strength actually. But there's still that part of them that has a personality disorder because they've been treated that way. I mean, right. obviously for Sid, who can't be touched without consequences, it's not that she has an antisocial personality disorder. It's that she can't be touched without consequences. But as a result, she's developed an antisocial personality disorder because she doesn't want to be close to anybody. Right. And, you know, and, and Jean Smart's character, you know, her husband left um, 20 years ago and she's grieving. And there's a certain degree that all of those things, like that she's going to find him and get him back, there is a version of reality where... That is a, that is her not being able to move on either, and and so you know that's from a character point of view that's the most exciting part of the show is it's not that that um, these are people with powers who go around doing powerful things it's it's is that we're using this show to to try to crack these characters. Yeah, that's worth talking about because I think from the very beginning, and certainly from when I first learned about the project, that was your way in. It seemed like that was what interested you. Um, you, you didn't have um, four color comic book ink stains on your fingers, but you were interested in reading these um, aberrations or superpowers, whatever you want to call them, as uh, extensions of psychology. Yeah, I mean, there's this existential identity to the show for me, which is, you know, like, what is it really like to be these people? And, and, um, you know, the carry carry dynamic came out of a need not to have, I mean, it was a very practical need in the beginning, which is like, well, how many characters can I have? Right. Um, cause you have to service all of them, et cetera. But now we're in the genre world, right? So what if there were two characters who lived in one body and then, you know, then you, you could sort of, you know, you could have the two when you wanted, or sometimes you could just have the one and, and, and then I thought, oh, well, that's that's interesting. Like, what is it really like, that person who's living inside of him? And what if it's a young, you know, Native American woman who's living inside of him? And, and um, but, you know, she comes out and she does the good stuff, and then she goes back in. She doesn't know what it's like to eat a meal or sleep or take a shower or, you know, as she says, whatever you people do in the bathroom. I think um, I said this a lot as a critic, and, and we don't need to name names of shows, but because I wrote about them and named names, but... In all these shows about the world ending remind me why it's worth saving 
show me one thing that is worth saving. Yeah. It's not just about fighting evil or not losing or not dying because that's not dying isn't the same as living. You know, I mean, there's, I mean, I, look, I'll, I'll say my our trailer, San Diego Comic Con last year, it dropped that weekend, and it dropped with all the other comic book movie trailers yeah. and 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 you know and and I watched them all and and there seemed to be this sort of universal approach to story which is that um all conflict is resolved through battle mm-hmm. right and and that might makes right so at the end of the day heroes and villains fight and the one that wins is the is the stronger one mm-hmm. you know what i mean and and it reinforced for me, I mean, my, my, the story was already there, but it reinforced for me how dangerous that can be if that's the only message that you're telegraphing to your audience. Um, and, and how this show differs fundamentally is the idea that, that um, you know, as, as Jermaine Clement says in episode four, it's like, figure your shit out. Like, if... Maybe if we spent more time trying to figure out why we're so angry about things or so mm-hmm. confrontational about things, maybe we wouldn't fight as much, you know? Maybe there'd be no need to fight. And this idea of diplomacy and this idea, you know, which is not inherently, I mean, it's not action, but it's dramatic, you know, and, and it can be feel like action if the stakes are high enough. Well, the thing that got me so excited last January when you first talked to me about this was I felt like you had you had pulled off this amazing trick. You had cracked this code because we are existing in a world where, you know, uh, IP is king, genre is king, superhero stuff. That's what people want. They want noisy. They want flashy. They want things that are in some way recognizable. Those things get made. But you've somehow Trojan horse to show that is actually about psychology and emotion into a show about people using their superpowers to uncover those things. Yeah. I thought that was quite a clever trick. Well, you know, you start off and, you know, we introduce, there's a lot of structural landmarks that people recognize. I mean, you know, there's this Division Three um, group that feels like they're our enemy and, and he escapes from them. He, he, you know, he escapes the empire to mm-hmm. go off with the plucky band of rebels, and and you know, there's something very familiar about that, and and so, your storytelling brain as as a viewer goes, oh, I see what they're going to do. Mm-hmm. It's going to be, you know, the underdog versus the overlord, and 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 then you know, and then Gene Smart says, well, just while we're building to that, we're just going to help you be the best you you can be, right? So we start to go into his memories, and then weird stuff starts happening in his memories. And by the time you reach episode four, you're like, I don't think that's the story at all. I think the story yeah. is like, what's going on with David? And and that the enemy within is so much worse than the enemy without. You know, I mean, part of the the fun for me of that fifth episode was like, we're building to this big action sequence of he's going to go to Division Three, and, yeah. you know... Um, and then, and then he goes, but we don't go with him. We go after he went. You yada yada it. Yeah. And then they show up and now it's forensic. And now you have this aftermath sequence where you start to see like this, something really ugly happened here. And that guy we really liked did some pretty terrible things. And, and, you know, this group division three that we were so afraid of, you know, you have possibly the most. David Lynchian performance outside of a David Lynch movie, which was, um, you know, our Division Three uh, actor on the ground. You know, it Half wears a floor. human face. You know, um, you know that sense of like um, it became a horror movie. It wasn't an action movie. You know what I mean? You thought, oh, it's going to be an action movie, and then it turned out to be something more viscerally yeah. unsettling. Right. I remember we talked about in the room that this was a haunted house story, but the haunted house was his mind. Yeah, and and. You know the the production reality of building this show from a script into what what it is now. You know, I kept saying to our production designer and to anyone who would listen. I mean, it's not the comic isn't called the X Men. It's called the Uncanny X Men, and and that word Uncanny is a very specific word. And and you know, if you do any research at all, you see, you know, Sigmund Freud wrote an essay about the Uncanny, which was about 
the power of the supernatural and why we're afraid of the things we're afraid of. And, and ultimately what scares us the most is not the unknown, but it's when familiar things operate in unfamiliar ways. So it's your haunted house, right? A house shouldn't do that, right? Yeah. Your daughter upstairs in her room shouldn't start speaking in tongues and her head spins around. Like, you know, when when we see, you know, uh, human creatures on screen who move in unnatural ways, it freaks us the hell out because we're wired that like things that we're familiar with should only act in ways yeah. that they're supposed to. And and so this idea of uncanniness, you know, the idea that the show itself has to feel that way and 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 unsettle us and I'm thrilled I have you on record now. That's the first time I've heard you reference the X-Men comic, despite making an X-Men-inspired show. Oh, yeah. And, 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 which is good, because, you know, I, I walked into this. I remember I told I, when I told my parents I was going to work on this show, and they were like, you're perfect for that because of all the comic books we had in the attic. And I said, actually, <laughs> he doesn't care about that. Yeah. But in, in keeping with that idea, one thing I do know from the X-Men comics is that one of, the, one of the, the central themes is always they're hated and feared by society. The version of the story that the comics almost always default back to is from the perspective of those who are hated and feared, proving themselves to be valiant and basically proving their humanity and their righteousness. Right. What you've done on the show is you've populated the show with humans and mutants equally. And what we see instead is maybe there's a reason sometimes why they're hated and certainly why they're feared. Um, the sense of being struck dumb or in awe with, with terror at what they see. I mean, that's the scene you're describing in Five when they see what right. he's done. We, our hero, quote unquote, we're, well, we're, we're three fourths of the way through the season. Our quote unquote hero might not be a good guy. Yeah, and my, my hope sitting down in the very first <clears throat> brainstorming sessions for, for this was, well, what if you took the genre out of it entirely? Like what, what is the great show here? And how do I end up with a genre show that puts me in, into these incredibly uh, unnerving moral quandaries the way, you know, in these moments like, you know, in season one of Fargo, you know, we've seen Lester Nygaard go from the, from the sort of bullied husband to killing his wife to just trying to get away with it to putting a gun in his nephew's backpack and framing his brother, you know, and there's, and, and beginning to feel like, oh, maybe he's not just trying to get away with it. Maybe it, there's something really, like, maybe this is a bad guy. Yeah. To the, to the moment where, you know, he pulls up outside of his insurance office with his second wife and he's looking in and, he's, and he has a bad feeling and he's like, actually, hon, I, I hurt my back. Can you go in? Mm -hmm. It was great. I got to watch that episode with an audience at the Paramount Theater in Austin. Um, and, you know, there's three grown moments. The first is he sends her in. Yeah. Then he stops her, and you think, oh, he's not going to do it. And then he tells her to take his Co orange yeah. coat. Then he stops her again, and he tells her to put the hood up because he would hate to see her pretty face get cold. And by the time she goes in there, he is the worst monster you've ever yeah. seen. And so the question becomes, in a, in a genre show... Um, you know, how do you create those Breaking Bad style m moments where I'm the one who knocks? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Where how do you take a character um, with the, when, when the stakes are sort of like, you know, s save the planet kind of stakes? Like, how do you have those visceral, you know, gritty human moral moments and... and and, and, you know, that became the thing of saying, like, well, this character in the comics isn't a hero. And, and you know, what I have always really loved about the X-Men is that that question of should I do good or should I do evil is not resolved once and for all. Yep. You know what I mean? And you see it with Fassbender or, you know, uh, that character, Magneto, which is like... Sometimes he's really a villain, mm -hmm. and then sometimes he can be, be convinced to be a hero, but he may go back, yeah. you know, and 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 that doesn't that makes him a more interesting character, right? Well, the work of a storyteller is to give them reasons, right? Yeah. And and a hallmark of Legion and Fargo is being a, the worst person in the world is really a question of opportunity, like whether you're put right. in a position and then maybe who you are in that moment. And yeah. We're talking about David's, you know, am, ambiguous morality. He does love Sid. As you said, as we said a moment ago, yeah. that is true, and that's 
that's nice. That's a good thing. That's a praiseworthy thing and something we can latch on to. But what he does in the orbit of that is an open question. Well, and, and you know, if you think about how ungrounded he is to the to the, the human world, I mean, he had a sister who put him there um, or kept him there or didn't really fight to have him out. So how connected is he really to her? And otherwise, he had Lenny. Um, and And yet, you know, because he's so unconnected, you know, because uh, he doesn't have that human connection, like his soul is really in question, you mm-hmm. know, he's he's vulnerable to making bad choices. Obviously, we've established that, that um, you know, he was a drug addict at a certain point, you know, so probably he, I mean, we saw him, I mean, he would lie and cheat mm-hmm. and steal and, and, you know, I mean, he has this inherent desire, I think, to have something nice and then he meets Sid and then and then she grounds him and she makes him want to be his best self but you know the reality is like it's not a sure thing that relationship and 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 the danger is if it doesn't work out then is it's worse isn't it i mean it's worse that he's seen the promised land but he can't live there and what does that do if it feels like love turns its back on him on mm-hmm. some level you know what what does he have left you know what is what does he care if humanity lives or dies or any of it i want to go back to something you alluded to a few moments ago when you were talking about um the direction in chapter five and chapter six and you know the impressive jobs that those two directors did and also not just on the screen but in translating what you had imagined onto the screen and and just that idea in general because especially for this show. I mean, this show operates with a very specific perspective, a very specific sort of dream logic. We all know from real life when our friend tries to tell us about their dream, yeah. it never works. No. And yet I, I, I remember one of my clearest memories from my experience in the writer's room was about eight weeks into it when at this point you were doing, you were prepping the pilot in Vancouver, which you directed. And I, I want to talk about that as well. Um, and we saw the the test footage, like color test, you know, and there was it was set some of the music you ended up using mm-hmm. in the series. And it was the first time we saw the jumpsuits, and it was the first time we saw them interacting, and we saw um, Rachel and Dan like with the the bathrobe string, which was something that you had talked about as an image before. And it was like a thunderbolt moment because it was finally like, oh, now I could see into your head. Because so much of a writer's room's job is trying to crack into the showrunner's head and try to service it the best of our ability. All of a sudden, we saw it. There it was. Yeah, that is the hardest trick, and 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 yet that's become more and more um, your job, as especially as you move into a show like this, which is so visual and so specific. Well, it's the same with Fargo, which is about the tone of voice, and mm-hmm. the only way to teach people what the show is is to make the show, is to show them the show. Yeah. It's not to give them a script or to pitch them a story, or, um, but how do you? How do the people who have to make the show know what the show is? Well, that's a conversation. That's a show, you know, that's, and that ultimately becomes why, you know, my job is to be a filmmaker and, and, and not just a writer. Because if I'm going to go ahead and, and ha- try to tell these unique stories, I have to be able to, to, sh- to make them myself so that I can show you that, no, this is what it is. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, there's another layer of interpretation, you know. I mean, there's Sam Esmail who's making Mr. Robot, but he doesn't do the pilot, right? So now right. he's got to convince that very good director. Well, you know, I want to do all this headroom and, and you, you know, I want to short side these characters on screen and I want to, you know. I mean, he as a filmmaker, he, he knows what he wants, but he's not allowed to do it himself. And so... You know, I'm sure they had a very positive experience, but the danger is that that a director comes in. You know, we had this on the second year of Fargo where I pushed to direct that first hour and, and, you know, they always worry because there's so many episodes after it. They they don't want you directing that first one because, you know, um, and their thought was, well, it's the the first hour of the second season, which is not what it is at all. It's the beginning of a whole new movie. But, you know, that director and I, and he... You know, he had directed for us before, and, and uh, you know, he just got on set that first day, and he's, and the camera starts moving in ways that are not, 
you know, it's floating around. It's not a Coen Brothers thing. There's just a sensibility mm -hmm. issue where I just kept saying to him, like, that, what are you what are you doing? That's not the show. And he kept saying, you're going to love it. And I kept saying, I'm pretty sure I'm not loving it right now. And <laughs> yeah. and ultimately, you know, maybe he had a version of the show that was great for him. But for me, you know, I mean, I walked into that diner set at the Waffle Hut. And, you know, I had these very specific things that were going to happen. They were, she, she was going to spray him with bug spray. He was going to pull the gun and shoot her the short um, the short order cook was going to run out of the back. The waitress was going to, you know, all that stuff. And I'm walking around as a filmmaker and I see there's a swinging door right between the kitchen and, and the restaurant. And I, and I pushed it and it swung, you know, back mm -hmm. and forth slower and slower till it closed. And I thought, wasn't well, that interesting that probably all the violence is done before this door even stops swinging. Right. And I said to the director, I was like, I'd love to get that piece. That wasn't his vision. He didn't shoot that. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I went back and shot it. Um, so, you know, it becomes our job, especially since television has become a visual medium, not just, so. you know, talking heads, not just L.A. law. Um, if we really want to tell the story with the camera, then 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 we're filmmakers. And and yet you it's one thing I feel like it's one thing to say it but it's another thing to be able to do it and I've, I've, I was always curious about that whether it was um, filmmaking was something that you felt drawn to regardless you know even though you were a novelist and then you were writing for television or was it really that experience that you're describing which you know as a creator I can only imagine would be frustrating of I wrote the script I understand what this thing this piece is and now I'm being denied the chance to you know to fully enact it well no, I wasn't the guy who was like, what I really want to do is direct. Um, but, you know, even beginning with The Unusuals, um, it was a show with a very distinct uh, tone of voice. Mm -hmm. And certainly with my generation, um, which was, we made eight of them for ABC, and it was a fake documentary in the style of the 7-Up series that Michael Apted did, mm -hmm. which was a fake documentary, which meant, all right, as filmmakers, I mean... If I, in order to write it, I had to go, well, you know, if you really look at the documentary as a format, it's really fascinating because, you know, usually the camera's not there. You know, it's not reality TV, right? It's like sometimes you've got archival footage. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you've got audio recordings. Sometimes you have still photographs like Ken Burns and, and you know, and you have interviews. And, and so that becomes a great challenge as a writer. It's like, all right, how do I come, how do I put a story together? with the conceit that I don't, ha I can't tell the story by just showing it happening. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And then from a filmmaking standpoint, well, you know, when they make a documentary, they don't know what's going to happen next. So the camera guy's there and he's like watching what's happening. But if two characters have a fight and one of them storms off, now we're chasing the mm -hmm. action. So whereas what you would normally do is you know, the characters would have a fight and she would go to her car. Well, there'd be a camera set up there for when she lands and you'd get the scene. In this case, what we get is what we get, right? So imperfect becomes perfect because you are you know when something feels real and not real. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've had to just because of the shows that I have created to think about the filmmaking of them for, for a long time. And then obviously when you make a show called Fargo, you know, in the vein of, of two of the greatest filmmakers of all time, you know, those guys write a lot of scripts that they don't direct, and those movies never turn out to be Coen Brothers movies, right? So it's right. not just the script. There's something in the filmmaking mm -hmm. of that script that makes a Coen Brothers movie, and and you literally can't ask them, how do you make a Coen Brothers movie? Because they don't want to talk about it, right? And mm -hmm. and I, I didn't ask them. Yeah. But, you know, because I knew better, because, you know, I, I respect their sort of reluctance to, I mean they don't do a lot of interviews and they never really want to, you know, the work stands for itself, but it became incumbent on me to go, all right, well, this is the camera. These are the rules of the camera and these are, mm -hmm. but you know, the Anton Chigurh example is still the best example, which is, um, you know, they gave him that haircut and they laughed at his face for like 30 minutes, but there's nothing funny about it in the movie. It's just this really unsettling yep. specific detail. And, you know, you could write, killer with a Prince Valiant haircut and hand it to another director and you might end up with comedy. You know, you, so if you want to do something specific, 
you have to do it yourself. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. One of the pleasures and then I think also challenges of working in the in a writer's room is that, you know, you follow uh, your muse when it comes to the writing. And, you know, I remember ideas would just emerge, you know, that we hadn't been working on on Tuesday and yeah. then you would deliver them on a Wednesday. And then now that's that's our direction because that's the authorial vision. That's the way ideas come to you. I was curious how that works. So I, I, I got to see up close and personal how that works with the, with the scripts, or at least in the generation, the, the generating of the ideas for the scripts. I'm curious about how that works with the visuals, because I do know there are certain things. And I'm thinking of um, uh, David and Sid with a pillow between them. That was right, right there from the beginning, and then it, there it was on the screen. Um, the Devil with the Yellow Eyes was a character, was written, it was up on mm-hmm. the board. We talked about it. But I didn't know what that character looked like until yeah. I think there was some test footage or something. Well, that character came out of our production designer, Michael Wiley, who said he was obsessed with the show My 600 Pound Life. Okay. Which is a reality show Yeah, for people who don't know it. And he said it's so, like, you can't look away and it's so horrifying. These people and, you know, and they're what, what the technical term grossly obese, you yeah. know, and and... And yet there's something like behind their eyes that just feels trapped and... Trapped in their own body. Yeah. yeah and so they're... But again, um, <clears throat> the uncanny, right? It's like humans weren't designed to be that big. Yeah. So when you, part of our reaction to people of that size is it just doesn't seem natural to us because that's not our experience of how human beings are meant to be designed. You know what I mean? So, um, but, you know, I want to say something about writer's rooms because... On Legion specifically, um, it's very difficult show um, to try to make in a writer's room because by definition, in my mind, a writer's room is an outline um, generating device. You get a bunch of people with their own worldviews in a room to kind of negotiate and the common currency is plot, Mm -hmm. right? The what you end up with is this happens and then this happens and then this happens, right? Which which works great for some stories that are plot-driven, but Legion is not a plot-driven show. It's sort of an experience and psychology-driven show. And so the problem when I would come in and, and would be pitched a whole story is that it, it, it had been very methodically thought out and, mm-hmm. and added up and everything sort of you know, was set up and, and paid off the way that, you know, all stories are sort of meant to be. Um, but uh, it didn't have that dream logic. It didn't have that, you know. And and um, so, so the room itself became, um, I won't, it, it wasn't an obstacle to making the show, but it was, it was challenging to try to work with the writer's room, especially because I wasn't there a lot of the time because, you know, I, I'm off doing the the other things. And so you guys would be sitting in a room working very diligently and very hard to create something that I would walk in and go, oh yeah, that doesn't feel right to me. Or, you know, it, it becomes very difficult, especially to the degree that, you know, I'm like the guy in, in, in Williamsburg making artisanal beer in my bathtub, right? Like it's, it's, you know, these are sort of handmade things and, and um, uh, you know, in the sense of, as you said, like the love story, like it's hard to know what that means, but there's a, a sense to me of how Im- important the idea of romance is, both in in the physical, literal romance of these two people, but also the romance of this world and mm-hmm. the wonder of what's going to happen next and the and you know my hope that every week there would be at least one thing a set piece or a concept or a visual that that blows somebody's mind a little bit you know what i mean and and that that um was more important on some level than like well what happens next it's like well you know we know sort of like i always knew in a basic sense of like he meets sid and they leave this place and they go to this other place and then they begin to look into his memories and his mind mm-hmm. and they discover something there. And then, you know, that becomes the story of the of the season. And it mattered less to me, like, the nuts and bolts of how those things all added mm-hmm. up logistically. Um, but it's very, you know, I mean, you could have a writer's room where one 
one person would just go orange and another one where they went like puma and mm -hmm. you know that would be more i think helpful <laughs> <laughs> well absolutely especially with a show like this though because it has to have an internal logic to make one person it has to be it has to be a singular dream logic in order for it to work and what was interesting about being in the room is you know nathaniel could say something that was deeply disturbing to nathaniel and we'd be like oh that's incredible that's really interesting and then jen would say something or brian would say something peter would say something all of those things were distinct idiosyncratic points of yeah. view unique to them when you try to stitch them together right. and then try to then daisy chain them to your unique point of view that's when it starts to to crumble and that's the challenge yeah and it's what you know the best directors really realize like tim mylance i mean one of the most important ideas in that fifth episode that was critical for their relationship david and sid is he finds a way for them to touch each other you know what i yeah. mean which is in, in in her in their minds basically but she has never since she was a girl been able to have physical contact with anyone let alone sex and mm -hmm. what and what that does which is like you know the first time you do heroin i i hear um and so the idea of how immediately all addictive that becomes so the fact that she changes in that in that hour in that first half of that episode yeah. to be someone who just wants to go back there and 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 he's becomes almost her cult leader because you know he's obviously different than the David we remember from the episode before and mm -hmm. he's like very seductive and charming and and she's completely addicted to him mm -hmm. and then he leaves her and and goes off and then she gets in a car with her friends and goes to this place where all these people have been massacred and you know you see it on her face. She's she's like coming out of the 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 addiction. She's like, what happened? What did he do? Who is that? Yeah. Who is that person that that I allowed and myself I? to be? Yeah. Um, and you know it's that's a critical step for her, and and uh, I think a very important goal in a story like this is it as. All the other elements aside, like it's got to be a visceral human experience. One thing that I've had to learn a little bit about since I moved here uh, is how buildings get protected against earthquakes. Uh, yeah. And one of the things that I've learned through through not at all neurotic research is the way there's like basically um, they build in wiggle room, basically. Right. right? They can move. Yeah. In, so they're not rigid against. Yeah. Not a brick building. The right. Yeah. I, I was thinking about that in terms of how you create these shows and specifically because... Um, you said it before, Jermaine Clement in an ice cube. Maybe my favorite thing so far, specific just thing in the season, that was not part of the show when I was a part of the show. That was potentially a season two thing that then suddenly became an episode four thing. Yeah, and I sat down to write episode four with knowing a little bit about what, I mean, knowing enough of like, well, David's mind is off somewhere and Sid's going to go off and yeah. try to figure out what was real. And I just found myself writing this guy in an ice cube. You know what I mean? <laughs> doing this speech to to camera basically and i was like oh i guess we introduced oliver yeah, which, um, which which we knew oliver yeah we talked about oliver but he was season two you know i do have a character problem because i like characters and i like a lot of characters and and you know i like the idea of multiple points of view and and you know certainly when we were gearing up to make the pilot um you know we've got um david and sid and you know, we see Patonomy and we see, you know, Amber, the fem female uh, Carrie. Um, and then at the end, we see Melanie mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, but I was already looking past that and going, well, they have to go to a place and that place has to have characters. Yeah. And and so, you know, I'm pushing FX to hire Bill Irwin. There's no character on paper for him. You know what I mean? But, um, you know, and then and then Hamish, who, who plays the, the, the interrogator, you know, I was like, I love that guy. I love that character. And so now Oliver comes in and it's like, well, I mean, if I could have anyone I wanted, it would be Jermaine. And then I get Jermaine and it's like, well, now I got to write for Jermaine, <laughs> yeah. you know. But but I think, I mean, you know, it's what he says in that scene. You know, you have these two. I mean, a story is inherently an empathy creation mm -hmm. Um mechanism right it's why we tell our kids stories so that they can go well you know i'm not this bunny 
but I can empathize with what this bunny's going through. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And and the more points of view you have, the more people you're forced to empathize with, the more invested you become in the show. Because you know, in Fargo, this works very specifically that if you really like Mike Milligan and you really like um, Ed and Peggy and you really like um, Patrick Wilson's character and you you know and and they're all on a collision course who are you rooting for like it makes the violence of it really hard to Mm -hmm. to to just sort of stand up and cheer for because you know I mean you're rooting for Jesse Plemons and Kirsten um, and you think I don't care what Gerhardt they send I am rooting for Jesse Plemons in that fight and then I send the kid with cerebral palsy in who I've spent the hour like he's got the meet cute with the girl with the with the front office girl you know about about Rocky um and now you're like, oh shit! Don't hurt that kid. Like you know, you, it becomes less clear. Like, well, maybe yeah. Jess, maybe I'd be okay if Jesse died here. You, you know, and then you find yourself negotiating to try to find the optimal. Yeah, so solution. I think that makes anything that we can do as storytellers to create an active engagement mm-hmm. with the story, um, where it's not just I'm sitting there watching this, but I'm invested and I'm engaged, and my imagination is engaged, which you know is a, is a really important thing in Legion where you know you see something and it makes your brain go oh but what if you know mm-hmm. all these things like suddenly and it's ex- an experience we have all the time as readers because you know the the writer of a book does half the job and you have to do the other half which is it becomes a story in your head with mm-hmm. visuals and you know but but film is a more passive medium and you know you can just sort of watch it but the best stories are the ones that where you're t- telling it along with the movie, you know, but that's also become something I think is a trademark and in a good way. You're, you, the audience doesn't know what's happening to them, but they like what they like what's happening. They're along for the ride. Yeah, and that's what matters um, is the, is the impact of it, and and that's the storytelling in three dimensions, you know. And we, you know, I, I we're talking about Legion. We have there are two more weeks left, two more episodes to go. You're already well well into the work on many other things. You've got movies coming up. You've got Fargo season three coming much sooner than I even thought it was coming because you're still making it. We're, I think we premiere April 19th. April 19th. And what episode are you filming right now? Uh, well, we block shoots. So we're shooting five and six right now. So you're, yeah. how's that going? I mean, this is, this is, this is the, this is the speed round where I just have to ask because I'm curious. It's going great. Uh, we, uh, I've seen three of the four hours so far. I shot the first one. Um, and I think we just locked it. Um, you know, I mean, it's thrilling to me, you know, this Fargo story, um, this, I don't even know how to, how to describe it. It's a type of storytelling that, that I, I have never found any place else to, to do it. There's something both very grounded and, and real about a crime story. And there's something much more abstract and, and thematic and about it that because it's such a simple story, it, you can do a lot of very deep and interesting things with it, at least to me, and hopefully no one will notice mm-hmm. on some level, right? If you just want to watch it as, you know, it's funny sometimes and I can't believe that <laughs> happened, that yeah. it works on that level. And if, you know, if you want to think about season two as, as, as a story about the death of the family business and the rise of corporate America, you can also think about it that way or in the myth of Sisyphus and, and the meaning of life and, you know, little, little things like that. Um, because hopefully it doesn't take itself too seriously, but it really feels special this, this third year to me. Um, and, and the actors are incredible and, and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's, I'm deep in that process of, you know, working with directors and and trying to make 10 hours that were directed by six people feel like 10 hours that were directed by one person. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, you know, I'm not there on set a lot. I was there a lot more the first year. Um, And, uh, you know, so it becomes, there is a process of, you spend a lot of time talking to directors and being involved in the prep and then, and then, you know, they shoot the show and you get in the editing room and go, why did they? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, there's also a lot of times in the editing room where you go, oh, that's so much better. I know you don't, uh, this is the part that you don't love, but to be to be glib or comic con but if you did want to tease the last two weeks of Legion, is there something you want to, is there a word or a feeling or maybe it's Puma that Puma, you want to let people orange. live? Um, 
you know, what's th- this show was never a, a mystery box show to me. It was never about I want you to be off balance. I want you to be confused. Um, it was always I want you to feel what David is feeling. And in the beginning, David had a lot of images and not a lot of information. Mm-hmm. And I think what you've seen now in the first five hours is that each episode you're getting a little more clarity, right? And so now we know it's a parasite, you know, mm-hmm. after episode five. And 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 so, you know, wh- where we're going to end up with is we're going to end up knowing things and we're going to end up with some decisive action that, that's going to happen and, and, you know, Step one, identify the problem. Step two, solve the problem. Um, but, you know, solving problems often creates other problems. And, and you know, I mean, I, I think what's really fun about the, the last two hours is, is, as should happen in a story, the, the pace picks up, the energy level picks up, the stakes get higher, and, and the life or deathness of it becomes very real. Um, and, you know, there's risk to characters that if, hopefully people really care about at this point and and uh you know and then there's some stuff in there where uh you know uh we we hopefully blow your mind uh two more times well i want to thank you for letting me be a part of it even in a small way and uh the only question remaining of course is do you want wax on the car yeah or- uh I, i'm not a big wax or starch uh, enthusiast on my uh, shirts either which are uh- on a hanger. I noticed that. Hanger. I was going to show yeah. a little initiative and get those done too. Uh, <laughs> no, no. You're, I'm, I'm glad uh, that you came to, to help us out. It was, uh, it, was, it was fun. And thanks for helping me out with this interview. Great to talk to you. Awesome.